Good evening, everybody. My name is Emily, and I wanted to thank you so much for joining us tonight for our virtual wine tasting with Jack Keegan. Jack is an instructor emeritus who taught the ever popular viticulture analogy class for 25 years at Miami. Jack's wine class is always full. His chapter wine tastings are well attended, and tonight is no exception. The Miami University Alumni Association is so excited for the opportunity to bring Jack to help you celebrate spring. I know we're all excited for a little bit of warmer weather. Um, there is an ask a question box located on the bottom of your screen underneath the video. Um, I will be monitoring these questions throughout, so please feel free to ask any questions you may have. Um, and we will relay them to Jack throughout the tasting. Although we do get a lot of questions um, throughout the tasting, so if your question is not asked, we do apologize. Um, but still, please ask away. Um, with that being said, go ahead and take it away, Jack. Great. Thank you, Emily. And good evening, everyone, and happy last day of winter. How is that? So, yes, it is coming. And actually, in fact, if you look, of course, on the screen, I have to thank uh, Carly Williams, who's one of our alums, who, in fact, is living in Italy for some of the pictures tonight. And in fact, uh, of this tree in bloom is in fact one of hers. And so I thought I would in fact start with that. Uh, I also wanna make a shout out to all the people in fact who I know are out there uh, from Red River Gorge to uh, Washington State, to Denver, to California, and I have been told even to Australia. So it's truly amazing how it, fun it is to know that people are out there sort of listening in and certainly will listen in afterwards in all of that. So happy spring all, um, as I said, uh, with this. Uh, as usual, here is the wine list for this evening and the order. Uh, we'll be doing, of course, the Prosecco first and then the Cabolani Pinot Grigio. I will also be doing the other Pinot Grigio from Arjolis uh, also. And then, of course, the Cantina Pedres uh, Vermentino. Actually, I did that wrong because it's a Teufelburner Pinot Grigio. And then the uh, Pedres Vermentino, followed by the Argiolis Vermentino, uh, for those of you who got it on wine.com. And then uh, two from Bruno Giacoso, who is one of the major names there. And Arnais, which is a grape you may never have had. And then Nebbiolo d'Alba, Nebbiolo being the grape. We'll talk about that later. And then, of course, the Baron Recasoli, uh, Rocca Giccarda, uh, Chianti Classico. Uh, again, Recasoli basically came up with the whole idea of Chianti or the recipe. And so very, very important. We'll talk a little about that as we get along with that. Um, I always talk a couple minutes about the world of wine. Um, as you may or may not know, the wine world on both sides of the Atlantic is thrilled because the tariffs that were put on wine of 25% uh, have are currently in a four month hiatus and probably are over. And so people on both sides of the Atlantic are very, very pleased with that. Um, I wanna mention a couple things that you said not so good. Stephen Spurrier was the person who did the wine tasting, which was called the Judgment of Paris that put California your wines to the map, and in fact was a major you know, influencer in wine throughout the world, and especially England. He passed away recently, and they're just an amazing person. You can read all kinds of incredible um, uh, uh, things about him, his obituary, but tributes to him is what I wanted to say. Um, interesting, of course, uh, you know, the world keeps changing. Europe is seeing the worst summer droughts in 2000 years, according to some recent studies that was out. And that, of course, luckily, grapes don't use a lot of wa water. So that has not bothered them, but certainly many other things. Uh, it was interesting, too, for those of you in Kentucky, they removed the barriers to direct shipping of wine. In other words, getting wine from very, from individual wineries, et cetera. You could not do that in Kentucky, and now we can. Um, some of you may have bought wine on wine.com, and their revenues in the past year, that they can thank COVID, rose 119% to $329 million. And so wine.com, in fact, is one of the many companies, many of them online, who have done very well thanks to it. As usual, we need to start tasting some wine, and so let's taste some wine first. Um, it's sort of interesting, and you may think, well, wait, Jack, we're doing an Ita Italian wine tasting, and of course you see it is Chloe, and that's because Chloe is, in fact, it's a, 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 a woman who does many of the blendings of the wine and for basically around the world, and some of them, in fact, are very, very good. As you can see, this is a Prosecco, and I wanted to do this because this is brand new. This is, it has been very, very recently that the, the government, basically, because that's who 
governs these things, allowed to make a pink Prosecco. And so this was the first Prosecco Rosé that I could find, and I thought it would be fine, fun to do. So this is Prosecco Rosé DOC. Uh, one of the things, in fact, I typically do also is show you how to open a bottle of sparkling wine. And so this is no different. Uh, typically, of course, it should come, and actually this one comes very nicely with a way to take off um, uh, just the top. Um, many of you know, I know I've said it before, John Dome always said, if you took away the whole capsule, the bottle looks naked and he never did that. And I don't either. Um, again, when you have, of course, the thing that comes down, which you can see there, right there, there's always six turns on the wire. And so if you turn it one, two, three, four, five, six, it will be open. You also notice I always put my thumb on the again for my non-dominant hand i'm left-handed and so i put my right thumb on the top to control the cork the other thing i always like to do is then turn the bottle and hold the cork and if you can see that carefully you can see in fact that that cork is rising but that i have it under control and if i do a good job you end up with that yay I did a good job and uh, I have an extra special glass. A dear friend bought me these sparkling wine champagne glasses. And so I thought I would bring it today to use. You can, of course, serve sparkling wine in white wine glasses. In fact, more and more, especially with like good champagne. But I really like um, putting it into a flute, as this is called, uh, in there simply because you do have uh, the bubbles. Um, and again, you can see this has a lot of bubbles, fairly large ones. Typically, the smaller the bubble, the better. But again, we're not talking about a wine, as many of you know. Obviously, you know the prices of what you paid for this wine. Um, this is not a, an extremely, this is a fun wine to drink. This is a springtime wine. This is the kind of wine, again, because of the color and you know time of year, perfectly good to drink. And if you smell this wine, Really, ah, oh, strawberries. I mean, it really is nice. It's really fresh strawberries. So nice in that, you know, really bright, light, fresh uh, flavors or aromas that are there. Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. Just so, so much strawberry. And of course, if you taste this wine. Mm. It has a much finer mousse. That's the bubbles than I expected, because again, and it may be the 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 uh, the glass, or sometimes, in fact, how clean it is. Though I am getting small bubbles coming up now, I was thinking with the larger bubbles that it would not have that really nice, fine creaminess to it, but it does very nicely. And wow, continues on with sort of strawberries and cherries in the flavor. The fruit is really there, very very nicely with this wine. This wine is ninety percent glera. Glera is the grape that goes into the production of Prosecco. You may remember, I've told you before, that we used to call the grape Prosecco. But if you if that's the name of the grape, that means somebody can make a Prosecco anywhere in the world. Well, they didn't like that because, again, obviously, the wine is also known as Prosecco. So they, they basically reached back to an older name called Glera. And so then they actually made the area making the wine Prosecco. So again, other parts of the world cannot use that name. Interestingly enough, though, it's also 10% Pinot Noir. And that, of course, is what gives it the color. It's a brut style. It's 60 days in stainless. So obviously, this has never seen oak. Nice, low alcohol, 11%. And residual sugar, it's in the brut style, is 10 grams per liter. You can get typically up to 12 grams per liter um, before it's considered extra dry before that. So it's sort of a little bit on the cusp uh, with this. But again, certainly you can taste the sugar, but because of the good acid in the wine, and I think that wonderful strawberry flavors and aromas, it is. It's easy drinking. It's really pleasant, etc. This is, yeah, this is not a super serious wine. This is a wine to enjoy, and especially on uh, again, I don't know how the rest of you are, but we're going to have a nice weekend here in Oxford this weekend. Uh, it's going to go probably towards, you know, in the upper 50s tomorrow and in the 60s on Sunday with, with sunny skies. So it's going to be beautiful. And spring hopefully will finally be here. As many of you know, we've had it. We had a 
two or three weeks of real winter where it was cold and rainy. And so we're actually a little bit behind um, in our, you know, where things are plant-wise. And so you'll see that. But spring certainly is coming this weekend, and we'll see lots of differences with that. Lovely wine. So um, this is, in fact, um, someone, in fact, asked the question. Of, I, got, I got this question earlier, so I will answer it. Uh, this is, a, you see, Prosecco DOC, and we'll talk about the various um, uh, classifications of Italian wines in a moment. Um, but the Prosecco DOC is very, very large. And then there are two towns, Val di Biadene and Conigliano, um, that, and sometimes you'll see them as individuals and sometimes together, they are in fact a step above. They feel that those wines from those two regions around those towns are better. And so they have a separate designation of, in fact, it's Prosecco Superiore, uh, which sometimes means something and sometimes doesn't. You can find very good Proseccos without that, but again, that's usually considered to be a step above. And then finally, in the center area, and in fact, it may be in this picture here, is the Cartesi. The Cartesi is the, is the central, central area, and that's where the best Proseccos come from. And so that's how it works up in here in the mountains. And of course, as you can see, it is absolutely beautiful. Interestingly enough, while I was doing my... Um, uh, research uh, to do some extra things for class. Um, I found an article about this that was in fact fairly recent and I wanted to to just tell you a little story. I took my class, I took a, a group of students from class in 2011 to Italy and we had gone obviously up to the Prosecco region. We went to Bertolotti and Daniele could not have been nicer and because they opened up on a Sunday afternoon for us and we spent a couple hours. He then got into our little bus and took us around the region, showed us the Cartesi and all the wonderful things that were there. He then took us to this building that you can see right here. This is Osteria Senza Oster. And what that means is this is a place where you can buy breads and cheeses and wine and um, things like prosciutto, etc. But it's all self-service and you just leave your money. In other words, it's all on the honor system. And it was really neat because here we are, of course, Americans and, you know, I mean, students and everybody else was basically in motorcycle leathers. And because they had driven up there either on their bicycles or on their motorcycles. And so it was just it was really interesting to see the differences. And of course, the view was just spectacular and everyone was really nice. And so it was really a very, very special evening. So I wanted to, or afternoon. So I really wanted to share that with everyone because it really is wonderful. Hopefully we will be getting back to travel and and everybody can have those kinds of experiences. But that was a special afternoon I thought I would share with that. And of course, it's Italy and it is, um, it's, the it's springtime in Italy, and so right away, one of the first things I think of is artichokes, the carcio, oh boy, carciofi, uh, just delicious. And in fact, is what they do to a tremendous amount uh, at this point in time, and so just really, really good. And so, it's one of the things in spring, this is one of the things you always have in Italy that end up being so important in all of that. Also, another picture from Carly uh, at this time, things start to bloom, like in this case, rosemary, it's not so cold that the rosemary dies back and so you can have it and of course there it is blooming and so you will find rosemary blooming all over the place with that so just wonderful springtime in that i was going to just take a moment um, and mention the wine laws before we get to the next wine the lowest the italians never really thought when they made their first set of wine laws that they were really going to make good wines they really felt that they were going to make a lot of okay wine because that's historically what they did. And so it took them a long time to sort of revamp the laws. So the lowest denomination you will see is Vino da Tavola, which is basically table wine. And most of those do not even see a bottle in a lot of cases. And in fact, you can still go to a lot of wineries and they will fill up your jugs. Um, and some of them can be quite good. I've had them. They added then uh, Indicazione Geografica Tipica, IGT is what you see on the label. And again, indication, geographical, 
Typical, typical wine. So these are very much like the what was called the Vin du Pays in France. And these are wines from the large area. Uh, Vini Toscana would be one from Tuscany and those kinds of things. And typically they can also be very good, but typically everyday wines. They made DOC, Denonazio Origin Controllata. And again, simply because it was done with politics, much of these areas are pretty large. They then have a, a, a one above that, as you see, DOCG, which is Denonazione Origin Controllata e Garantita. Uh, and this is a guaranteed wine. And again, there are now, gee, I'll bet there's probably 80 or 90 of these areas. But many of them are the famous ones that you know. Chianti, uh, Brunello di Montalcino, uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, uh, Barolo, uh, Barbaresco, uh, those kinds of things. And so they really are, in fact, typically the most important wines in Italy. And so you'll see those names and labels on there. Of course, that doesn't exactly go with the, um, uh, also goes with the, um, uh, the European labeling, but we're not going to go into that today. So let's have our second wine. Um, our second wine is Cavolani. Uh, it is a Pinot Grigio. Uh, and by the way, Typically, you'll hear a lot of people sort of Frenchifying that name, for lack of a better term. It is actually Pinot Grigio. And this is the exact same grape as Pinot Gris. It's just that obviously that's the French name and uh, thing. And of course, in America, we use both. Typically, if you have a wine from a, California that's Pinot Grigio, it's lighter and lemony. Uh, if you have a Pinot Gris, it tends to be, oh, I find a little bit more uh, sort of bread overtones and maybe a little bit more waxy, a little more heavy, eh, serious for lack of a better term, uh, also in that. So uh, let's try the Cabalani. It's interesting. I never thought about that because it is a Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, and uh, it's in a Bordeaux bottle. This is actually a Bordeaux bottle where actually all these are in a Bordeaux bottle. So I can't even show you. Actually, the Chloe is sort of, this is closer to what a Burgundy bottle would look like. Uh, but in fact, all of these are Bordeaux bottles. In fact, what a typical Bordeaux wine would be like uh, with that. Uh, again, nice pale. And actually, I'm seeing a little bubbling in there, which is not unusual. Very often, especially with these wines, you will get a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, CO2 left in the wine. And I actually do see a little bit in there. If you swirl and smell this wine. And, oh, oh, wow. Again, and actually I've used Cabalani in class before, but sometimes I'm always amazed again when I when I smell them. So fresh, so floral. I mean, springtime. I mean, it really just has that wonderful aroma in there. Real nice fresh fruits, maybe sort of peachy. Obviously a little citrus, but more in the peach way than uh, citrus. So pretty. Of course you taste this wine. Mm. There's a lot to like about this wine. It has good acidity. It has really nice, fresh fruit flavors. But at the same time, it has a little weight to it. In other words, you, you know you're drinking something. It's not certainly watery. It has a nice depth of flavor, nice weight to it. Um, a little herbal. Uh, also, um, having, you know, yeah, just sort of really sort of nice herbal finish to it right away, too. I think of so many foods that's been good. I mean, it's perfectly good by itself, but you could certainly do this with uh, with chicken dishes. You could do with pasta primavera. There's any number of things where this would be really nice. All kinds of seafood, but this would be really good. This is a really very nice Pinot Grigio. And not too expensive, which is very nice. Again, this is where it's from. It's from Friuli, as you can see, uh, all the way over there. In fact, right basically on the Slovenian border. Uh, and again, those borders are now, again, fairly porous again. So you see it all the way over on the side. Uh, this, of course, is the grape, the Pinot Grigio uh, grapes. Uh, and actually, very often, they may be a bit pinker because Pinot Gris is the pink variety of Pinot Noir. It's really very, very close to it. So very often you'll see them a bit more purple in color. Um, this is one of the largest estates in all of Italy. And, uh, you know, again, I mean, 
look at that vineyard just continuing on it's gigantic basically uh and so certainly amazing when you when you see those differences that go on with that so very very neat uh with this here of course they're picking the grapes though these grapes were picked by machine and you will find picking by machine more and more common uh around here with this it's 100 percent pinot grigio machine harvested and gently pressed. And then after fermentation, it spends six to seven months, as you see in 30,000 liter stainless steel tanks. So again, it le lets it to knit a little edging. Then they keep it for three to six months longer in the bottle before they send it out. This wine is young and is meant to be drunk young. Uh, and even though, you know, I mean, so it's only, it's only a year, a little more than a year old, really, really quite lovely. Mm, very nice. I should ask Emily, actually, well, actually, maybe I'll do the Teufelbrunner, then I'll ask if there's any questions, okay? The Teufelbrunner, um, for one thing, <laughs> your first question could be, what kind of word in Italy is Teufelbrunner? You know? I mean, let's be serious. And it's because, again, this wine is from the Alto Adige, up in the north, even northern, so the next province over from Friuli. By the way, Friuli is Friuli Venezia Julia. Um, but much of this area belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In fact, certainly did much of Italy for a very long time. So at the end of World War I, because obviously the Habsburgs, the Austro-Hungarians lost and the Italians won, they took over much of these northern areas of Italy. And in fact, you will find still the street signs are in German and Italian. And so you find both. And so Teifenbrunner obviously is a Germanic name for this. And you find a lot of places like this up in the north. Um, again, it's a screw cap, a little different. And I will try this. As many of you may have gotten this on wine.com. That's why I'll take a moment uh, and taste it. Uh, see what differences there are in this wine. Again, color certainly the same. I don't see the bubbles that I did in the Cabolani, but that's fine. And really, you know, and I think I'm, I'm actually very happy because, you know, I went on wine.com and tried to find good things. It might be a little cold, uh, at least for me, but the aromas are amazingly similar. Not surprising. You really are getting the aroma of the grape. And these are two very sort of mainstream, mainline Pinot Grigios. And there are so many Pinot Grigios that are, again, I think reasonably priced, meaning certainly way less than $20 in most cases. And you can find them and they really are very, very nice. And this is, again, maybe a little bit brighter uh, than the Kabbalani. But again, probably coming from a higher elevation and so probably has a bit more acid. I'm going to have to taste this wine. Yes, most definitely. It's really, it's just, it's, it's fun. Again, unfortunately, most of you don't get a chance to do this, but again, it has more acid. There is no question. The, the Cabellani, softer, rounder, a little more depth. This is also very, very fresh, but mm, just really much more in the lemony style and really bright and fresh and crisp. Uh, and so again, it shows you how where the wine comes from makes a difference. And this shows, in fact, very, very well uh, on this wine. Uh, and again, this wine got 91 from enthusiasts, aromas of honeysuckle, green apple. Certainly the green apple is there. Honeydew melon followed with juicy palate followed note of white peach. Tangy acidity, uh, as I said, that's really what hit me on this wine compared to the Kabbalani, lifts the rich flavors. And it really was. It's a very, very nice little Pinot Grigio. Okay. Any questions, Emily? Yeah, we have we have had a couple come in. Um, sure. so one says, sorry, let me click over to it. So she said, Judith said that she could not find the Chloe Prosecco on wine.com, so she bought a Chloe Rosé. She said it's the same exact label, except it says California instead of Italy. Is it the same wine, or is it different being rosé versus prosecco that's a good question and no it's a totally different wine um only in fact probably about the only place well i take that back one of the reasons that they changed the name of the grape from prosecco to glera is because they began it was actually in brazil if i'm not mistaken that they were growing the 
Prosecco, the Glera grape. And so they began making Brazilian Proseccos. Needless to say, the Italians didn't like that. Uh, and so I don't, I don't think there's any acreage of Glera at all in California. And there are all kinds of grapes in California. That's a really good question. But I don't think I have ever seen, because I, I scan down through those uh, looking at acreage. And so I don't think so. So, you know, this would be this exact would be very different uh, grapes also uh, for that. The Chloe. Really, if you think about it, Chloe is a brand. In other words, it is, it's basically based on, in fact, in fact, if you really look, it's really interesting because it's a lot of women winemakers, et cetera, which is wonderful, but they really are working in a number of different places and sort of making wines as a portfolio rather than individual companies or individual wineries. And so it really ends up being more of a portfolio than individuals. And so that's what you're seeing. And so Chloe is sort of like the overarching brand for these various wines. Thank okay. you. Yep. And one more. And this one I can actually put on the screen because it was asked through YouTube. So Alexander asked, there are now the wine stoppers that will take out the oxygen for you to preserve your wine for a later time after you open it. Would that work for a Prosecco? And then she said, or a soda stream or something that would add carbonation. Um, two things. I'm not sure. If they are talking about the, of course, now my mind is going blank. If they're talking about the, uh, there's a there's a new, gee, it's going to bug me, Coravin. Ah, finally. Uh, the mind still works occasionally. Coravin is, might be what she's talking about. And this is a new thing that you basically put through the cork and you can take wine out of the bottle and it replaces the, the wine with an inert gas, typically argon or nitrogen, so that the wine will stay fresh. And so that's really nice if you want small amounts, et cetera. But typically, obviously, if it's a few people, they will simply open the bottle uh, with that. And so that if that's what she's talking about, um, they do work very well. But typically, again, if you want small amounts of wine, typically you would just open it. And of course, you can buy the inert gases, argon or nitrogen, that you can spray in a bottle. If, say, you're going to have half a bottle and you want to have the other half a few days later, and it will keep them much fresher. That's probably one of the best ways, in fact, to keep wines is by doing that, because never forget, air is the enemy of wine. The wonderful thing about sparkling wines is that what they are giving off is carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is heavier than air, and it also, of course, removes, because as it's bubbling up, it takes, there's no oxygen getting in. So I find of any wines that stay very nicely for several days, it is in fact sparkling wines. As we've talked about before when I've done sparkling wines, you know, if you can just get the stoppers, the sparkling wine stoppers that simply hold the CO2 in, typically that wine will stay very fresh for three, four, five days. I've certainly had them and they've been fine. So that's really what the best thing to do when dealing with sparkling wines. Otherwise you want to remove, you want to you want to take the air out by adding an inert gas, as I said, like nitrogen or argon to that bottle and then put a cork in it and probably throw it in the refrigerator. Okay. Yep, perfect. The, more, the other questions are more general questions so we can save those for later on. That's fine. Yep. We'll continue on then. Thank you. Again, pictures, you know, and I know, and one of the, re one of the things that I thought about Today, uh, again, since we have not been traveling and things are, of course, are looking up, uh, though not so much, unfortunately, in France and Italy. They're both, in fact, are, are closing down at the moment, France, Paris for the next month. Um, but I thought, you know, I would certainly share uh, the beauty of Italy in pictures. And, of course, you see the sort of developing um, olive trees here and the vineyards in the background uh, in springtime in Friuli in this. Uh, this is also, again, a gorgeous picture. Of course, you can see the olive trees on both sides. This is the Herman, J-E-R-M-A-N-N winery, which in fact has always made top of the line wines. And they in fact have recently been sold. Uh, and this is part of the article that was there. In fact, now of course, 
I'm kicking myself for not writing it down because I had forgotten who who bought Harman, uh, but it was one of the big labels, in fact, that was doing it. I don't think it was Antonori. Uh, but again, they make very, very, very good wines from up in this region. And again, you see beautiful place uh, there. So that's why I added that to it. Okay. Um, your next wine are Vermentinos. And Vermentinos are one of those grapes. It's really great. You know, the, the wine world... I mean, let's face it, you know, and of course, really, when you stop and think about it, especially here in America, we've been drinking fine wines for maybe 50 years now, maybe a little less than that. And in some ways, that seems like a long time. But, you know, many of you can probably relate to drinking Ingle Nook and various other kinds of wines in the 60s and 70s. And so the really better wines didn't probably start until the 80s in many cases with this. And you also remember, and you even think, I mean, not very long, it was basically like people drank, some people would only drink Chardonnay, some people would only drink Cabernet. And then, of course, Merlot got bigger. And then Pinot Noir, of course, has gotten bigger. And then, of course, more Sauvignon Blancs, etc. But really, if you think about it, the grapes that we drink, the wines that we drink, probably 90% of all the wines are like 10 different varieties. When there are easily over 600 different varieties in existence and far more than that but these are the ones that are actually under vine i mean in other words in vineyards but one of them that's been really interesting to watch in the last just few years has been vermentino and that's because people are realizing the quality of vermentinos and in some of the areas you know again when it's grown in the right areas they can make incredible wines uh and so that's what's been fun and that's one of the reasons why i decided i would showcase some vermentinos tonight so the next one we're doing is from pedres uh it's a it, brino is the name and even though of course i read several things they never say exactly why they called it brino it's a vermentino di galora and again you see this is a docg so this is in fact one of those guaranteed areas uh in there uh and I also apologize again. I actually had this label up first, and then I saw that one. I thought, oh, I'm wrong. But here, this is what it is. In fact, it says Vermentino de Galora DOCG from Pedra. So certainly the same. And I was assuming, uh, again, I've tasted some of these wines beforehand, but typically Vermentinos are finished a little sweeter. And so that's why we did the Vermentinos after the Pinot Grigios uh, in there. And so you see, again, a little, actually, a little more golden. Uh, than the uh, Pinot Grigios were. Um, uh, and by the way, these wines are, at Vermentino de Galura, both these wines are from Sardinia. And so we've gone from the very far north of Italy all the way to the south, but in many cases up in the mountains in Sardinia. Uh, these were fairly low, 400, 400 feet, but many of them, in fact, are much higher. Uh, and typically, not surprisingly, the higher the elevation, um, usually the amount of grapes per acre, tons per acre, are less, and the quality goes up. And in fact, with Pedres, they do make, in fact, one or two levels above this one. So again, if you swirl and smell this wine, uh, so fresh. You know, again, so really nice in what you've got there. Just really pretty, fresh fruit, almost, and again, very floral, really flowery, really, really tremendous fruit. Mm. And again, if you taste this wine. Mm. Again, I mean, you know, really spring into summer, I mean, even more. These wines are so floral. I'm actually glad we did the second. These wines are so floral. I mean, it really is just sort of amazing. The the white flowers, just all the just wonderful fresh fruit that you have in this wine. And really what you're getting is not sugar. What you're getting is so much fruit from the Vermentino. And Vermentino tends to be a very, very floral, very aromatic wine. And obviously this is, this is a beautiful example of that. Wow, just lovely. And perfect, you know, perfect for a late uh, spring evening or into early summer because it's so refreshing because it's got great acidity. And so it really is thirst quenching at the same time. Mm. 
again, here we are down there in Sardinia. By the way, Sardinia is probably a full 150 miles away from Italy uh, with that. So again, sort of really quite neat. Um, and so uh, as, as you can see there in the mountains uh, there, in fact, this is where these wines are from uh, in there. Um, again, I couldn't resist, uh, you know, Sardinia, I mean, just a beautiful island. And so you have these kinds of, of vistas in springtime that are so nice, in fact, with all of that. Sort of very, very neat, uh, which is great uh, there, as you can see. Uh, and what shocked me, um, as it probably does you as you look on this screen, is that actually in Sardinia, they have a tulip festival. Uh, and in fact, it started in February, not surprisingly, um, because I remember, in fact, going, for example, to the Cinque Terre, and I was there in late February, and the daffodils were blooming. And so, of course, being in Sardinia, not surprising, it would be early. They actually do grow tulips and have a tulip festival. And so I saw this picture online and thought, oh, I had to share because the color is just absolutely wonderful. So, again, there's all kinds of things, of course, to see in Sardinia. And this is uh, cystus or, blue, or broom also blooms early in the spring. And, of course, you will see it all over Italy uh, in springtime. And so broom is also something you will see in a lot of cases with this. Again, a little bit more about the wine. It's 100% Vermentino. Uh, grapes are, it tells you exactly where they are. Galora in the north, uh, three to 500 feet above sea level, sandy soils, three tons per acre, uh, harvested by hand, uh, soft pressing, fermentation, again, relatively cool, 60 to 65. Again, sees no oak, three to six months in stainless steel, sterile bottling. And they say, again, straw-colored green highlights, delicately bouquet of fruity and flowery, Really, just as I said, I mean, it just, I mean, and you, you could not say a different thing with that. Dry and fresh. Also, again, you know, no sugar. Food matching as a aperitif, seafood starters, white meat, and grilled seafood, I think is what it was supposed to be there. Uh, serving temperature, again, relatively cool. Actually, it might be a little warmer than 50 or 53, but still, that is just a lovely wine. So drinkable. And that, oh, that aroma, just so, so floral. So pretty. Uh, again, uh, they sent me pictures. Uh, uh, this is, in fact, these are actually pictures from January. Uh, and these are the vines before they were pruned. Uh, they're up in the mountains. And so I thought that was really sort of interesting to see. Uh, and this is, in fact, again, a different view. But this is the vines, in fact, after they have been pruned. And so you see the, uh, you know, the post-pruning vines. Uh, they were doing it, in fact, typically in January. Um, again, you can see it. It never gets really cold there in the middle of the Mediterranean. And so, in fact, it was still very green on the hillsides and in the vineyard itself. But the vines, of course, are dormant uh, with that. And then this is one of the shots from their place, obviously much more in midsummer. Uh, you see, of course, the same hills and up there in the mountains, etc. So beautiful, beautiful vineyards and certainly really interesting to visit with that. Uh, the other Vermentino, for those of you who got it through wine.com, is the uh, Costa Molino. Uh, this is Vermentino, again, the Sar Sar excuse me, um, uh, Sardinia, which is Sardinia, of course. And this is from Argiolis. Argelis is a very, very, very well-respected producer uh, in there. So I thought it would be fun to do. And again, you see it's a DOC. Oh, different. This is deeper. Actually, I'm really glad, again, for those of you who had this. Um, yeah, it's much more, uh, it's almost, again, for lack of a better great word, this is a terrible sort of grapey because it's much more fruity rather than floral that you got out of the Brino, out of the other Vermentino. Oh, yeah. It's really, again, beautiful fruit, though. And has almost a little bit of a, almost a little bit of a, uh, aromas almost of, uh, uh, not, not vinegar. Um, oh, geez. My mind's blank for a second here. Um, Uh, balsamic. It's a balsamic aroma. It's almost like a white balsamic vinegar. We're going to see that white balsamic. But really pretty, wonderful, nice, ripe fruit. And of course, you taste this wine. Yes, a little more 
depth, a little more um, uh, grip to it, uh, not as bright and floral as the other, but still very appealing, very nice. In my opinion, more of a food wine. I think this would in fact go better with a lot more things. And again, right across the board, seafood, chicken, um, uh, vegetables, pastas, those kinds of things. I really think it was because there's a nice acidity to it would be very nicely against cream sauces and various things along those lines. Uh, these, in fact, are those their vineyards at Arjolas. Uh, again, another picture, in fact, it was um, written up, in fact, a number of years ago in the New York Times, in fact, was given a Best Buy uh, in there. And in fact, this wine got 92 from James Suckling. Uh, wet stone, and you do get that stony minerality. Lemon zest, dried apple, and thyme on the nose, being to full body with lovely creaminess and layers of citrus, stone, and tropical fruit. Very true. I mean, it's much more in that category than the, the floralness of the Brino. Both lovely, really great to see two different styles of Vermentino uh, that you can have. And of course, he said drink or hold in there. Okay. The next white uh, is one that you may not be familiar with, uh, and that is a Rorero Arnaise. Uh, and this is from uh, Bruno Giacosa. Uh, Bruno Giacosa, who passed away a few years ago now, uh, but the family, of course, is still carrying on with it. And, of course, you see the castle there at the top. Um, this, is in, uh, uh, this is in the Piedmont, as you can see in the bottom of the Piemonte, the Piedmont uh, area. And, of course, this Arnaise is from a DOCG in there. Roero is a town not very far from Barolo and Barbaresco, basically across the river. Uh, and now making white wines. But in fact, most of the wines from the Piedmont, in fact, were red uh, in there. Uh, and so this is very different. This is, uh, again, all of these wines are delicious. This is also, I have no doubt, will be delicious. I've had this before, but it's a more, quote unquote, serious wine when it comes to that. But of course, you probably saw the price tag. And so it's a little more expensive than the other wines also uh, with that. So again, it's 2019. Uh, a bit more golden, not that much different. I'm actually getting a little interesting. I'm getting a little bit of bubbles I see in this, like the Cabalani. Uh, I'm actually seeing some spritz uh, in the glass, really, really tiny bubbles as I put it in there. Uh, sort of very neat to see. And if you swirl and smell this wine, Again, interesting to an extent, or in some ways, it re will remind you again if you have, if you've gotten the Argiolis Vermentino, uh, it has some of that same depth of character. Might also be a little cold. Mm, but you're really starting to get now, uh, just a, again, there's a, a wonderful sort of stony minerality to this wine. Also, almost a little bit, almost of a of a nuttiness to this wine. Again, just sort of hints of almond or hazelnuts, with of course the fruit, pears more than anything else, and almost a little bit. And I, you know, again, I have to look again if if it's a seen some oak because it, you do get a little bit of vanilla in there. Yes, lovely wine. And again, if you taste this wine, I feel the spritz a little on my tongue. And so you can tell that the bubbles are there. Mm. Mm. Again, obviously there are fruit. Uh, pear, almost going into though almost a sort of vegetal, almost almost a little bit of almost avocado uh, in the flavor, you know, because it, you have a much more greener fruit that is there. Um, and then just this wonderful sort of almond uh, stoniness that's there and a real grip to it. You know, it's one of those white wines that if you did it blind, you might think was red because it just does, you know, it has a little bit of tannin, just has a, just a, a grip to it that you don't find certainly in any of the other white wines that we've had in all of that. Gee, that's just beautiful. 
the people at Giacosa were very kind to send me pictures. And so these are the vineyards. And by the way, you can see how old those vines are. And in many cases, you almost have almost like a stump of, I think I've got some more close-ups, but you almost have a stump of trunk. And then from that will be almost just a single cane, meaning in fact, one branch that was last year's shoot. And it will probably have six or eight buds on it, which in fact will form then the shoots for this year. And so yields are very low. And this, as you can see how these vines are done, they are very, very low. And then you can see the catch wires on the vines, as they come up, then they, the, the vines are grown upright in the catch wires. But look how beautiful. I think the Piedmont is just, I mean, again, because it's hilly, it's, again, Piemonte, Piedmont, foot of the mountain. Because, again, it's right below the, um, the Alps. And, in fact, in many cases, you can see pictures of the Alps in the distance. And, of course, not very far away. Turin, of course, is there. You know, we, they, they did the Olympics, the Winter Olympics there uh, one year. And so you're there. This place is, is more of a, uh, what's what I'm looking for, a continental climate. It gets colder. They, in fact, they can get lots of snow in the wintertime, which is not so common uh, in much of the rest of Italy. Uh, again, you see, this is a close-up again of one of the vines uh, in there. And again, I mean, Giacosa was kind enough to send me these pictures. In fact, this is what it looked like eh, probably about 10 days ago. And you see, in fact, that the grapes have not started to grow, though they did send me the buds are beginning to break just a little bit. And this, of course, is the Giacosa estate uh, up there on the top of the hill. And of course, you see these hillsides with these vines. And this is, in fact, a picture that they sent to me uh, just last week. Uh, and so you can see, in fact, where those grapes grow in all of that. Again, here they have, in fact, you see the vine cuttings that, in fact, are there uh, with that uh, in there. And again, there's another great picture uh, of the Giacosa vineyards in all of that. And it was nice. In fact, as you can see, some of the vines or from the um, trees, uh, this is probably almonds. Uh, almonds or cherries are typically first, and so they're starting to bloom uh, there. So it's are very neat uh, for them to send me these pictures. Uh, again, uh, winemaker notes and 10 straw with greenish hints. The nose prevents lemon, pineapple, peach, and apricot notes with floral hints. Palette fresh, full body, certainly with mineral notes and a persistent finish. Uh, James Suckling again gave this wine 92. Uh, dried peach skin with lemon and crushed stone or cement on the nose. No question, it's full to medium bodied. Lovely, soft texture. Yeah, it's just beautifully textured wine and rich and a fresh finish with lots of dried fruit, a little richer than usual. And this is just a lovely wine. Mm. Yeah, it's and it's like that baked pears now in the nose. Questions, Emily? Yes. Okay. So somebody said, please explain your swirling technique. When <laughs> she does it, she said it's not so smooth. So if you have any <laughs> tips for her. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one thing, it's years and years of practice. Uh, you know, I mean, that certainly is true. But I... That's interesting. And I guess I never really think because really you you really hardly move the glass at the base because obviously it's it extends up along the stem. And so the small movements below become a much larger uh, movement at the top. This, of course, is one reason I always try to tell my students this. You don't want to uh, fill your glass very full. And again, why do you swirl? Because this causes so much of the wine to basically get into the air. So you're aerating the wine and so you're smelling it better. And so that's why it's very important. I still have to laugh and I don't know if you can see both, but in fact, actually, maybe I'll put my phone up so you can actually see. When I swirl in the air, which of course is what you always see, I always swirl clockwise. And when I put it on a flat surface, I always swirl counterclockwise because, again, you can do that. And some people find they're more comfortable swirling on a flat surface. And so if I swirl on a flat surface, <laughs> it's the strangest thing. It feels really weird to do it clockwise. But yet, no, I can't even – I don't even think I can do it counterclockwise in the air. I can't. Isn't that oh, – yeah, okay, I'm weird. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, but that's something. I don't know why that is. I've never talked to anyone either as to why that's true. But in the air, I do clockwise. When I'm on the thing, it's definitely counterclockwise. And yeah, I, 
and I can't even do the opposite, which is too hilarious. And I haven't even been drinking. My God. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> that is weird. That's Have weird. You been trying it? If anyone else has been trying it, I would be interested to get if I get if I get anything, if I get feedback from people as to if they think if I'm the only weird one in the world or if everyone else is the same way. No, I've, I, I'm trying it and I don't know. It does feel it does feel weird. Um, <laughs> on that note, somebody asked, what do you think about wine aerators? Um, uh, typically very little, sorry. I, uh, maybe I have had too much to drink. Uh, and so I, you know, I find for the most part, I would rather have the wine develop in a glass. And it's funny, we were talking about that. I was talking to my class about decanting because uh, again, uh, this week, and in fact, I typically do, this is in fact, probably the last year I will do this since in fact they sold. Um, I always do Burgess wines. Of course, Tom was a 1961 alum from Miami University and I always do a little bit of an homage to him. He obviously passed away a number of years ago, but he and his son Steve were always great supporters of it. And so we tasted this week the 2010 and the 2015. And the 2010, in fact, was donated by Burgess to the class. Uh, but I was talking about the 2015 as being a red, relatively young, uh, that could use decanting. In other words, it could go into a, a glass thing that you might swirl a little bit or at least have so that it gets air. Because this is the whole reason we do any of this. You want to increase the amount of air that a young wine gets because then those chemical changes will take it. In many cases, with a young wine, it will open it up and make it more flavorful. will also soften up the tannins because again, a young wine can sometimes be pretty tight with the tannins. And so if it is that way, if you give it some air, um, it will make it better. Now again, this could be an apoc apocryphal story, uh, but I've heard very often, uh, you know, again, in the wine trade, that when someone's bringing out, you know, say a new release that in fact ends up being very, um, uh, very tannic, and maybe they think it's a little harder. And of course they want to sell that wine. Uh, I've actually heard stories of people like throwing it in the blender for 30 seconds to, to ultra aerate the wine, to soften it up so that then of course it, taste better. I've never tried it to tell you the truth, uh, especially because this is interesting. If any of you are chemists, many people think that wine is a colloid. It's just, it, it actually has a structure to it and that those kinds of things sort of break it up. But that's why I've never been a real fan. I've done some aeration. I mean, with an aerator myself and I don't know, it never tastes for some reason, maybe uh, this is a, a, not a good word, authentic. Uh, as I would think uh, for that. In other words, I, I prefer having it open naturally in the glass or opening in a decanter. In other words, just letting the air sort of get to it slowly rather than sort of forcing it in some ways. My my two cents. Okay, one more quick, sure. one, more quick one then um, that kind of goes along these lines is how do you know when a wine is ready to drink? Are most of the wines at the grocery store ready or are wines like wine stores a better source than grocery stores? Um, that is in fact a very good question because it's probably in fact one of those questions that is so difficult to answer. I would tell you that for the most part, most wines below $20 a bottle, and I hate to use price, but again, it's just sort of, it's part of the thing, are certainly ready to be drunk as soon as you get them. Uh, again, to put it bluntly, over well over 90% of all wines should be drunk within one to three years of bottling. Does that mean that they can't last longer? No. I have had many, many wines, you know, again, now, well, I'll give you the example, but probably the, my, my, the most common example for me. Um, when I'm making, especially when I would have my wine open houses, I always made beef pork and young. Well, of course, I would need some wine to do with that. So we would go down, I would go down through the cellar, and I would try to find wines that either A, were maybe a little older and really weren't very expensive. Because once you cook with it, once it's been especially braising, you know, it doesn't really matter, but it does good to have those flavors. And so I would go down and bring up typically several bottles. And of course, then it was it was always the decision. So we would open the bottle and of course I would pour it a little into a glass. And of course it's like, 
nah, this is too good to put into wine, to put into the beef. And so then we would drink that one. And so we would find things that were still good. I mean, obviously nothing wrong with those wines, but they were like, eh, yeah, these are just okay. So we'll cook with them. And so that's what we would do. And, and I've been shocked at how many wines, you know, three, five, seven years of age are still drinking very, very well uh, for that. So even though I say one to three years, and that's probably the sort of best window, they there are many wines, especially if they're stored halfway decently, meaning no big fluctuations in temperature, no bright sunlight, uh, keeping them relatively cool, they're fine. And I, you know, again, you don't have to have a cellar to do that. Just any good, you know, closet or someplace where it's not going to get too warm is probably good uh, for that. And so. And so that's my thing. Then otherwise, you need to go through scores. Uh, and also, of course, if you're buying a half decent wine, you know, buy a case. And then you just sort of taste it through over the years. And, you know, and you can sort of decide. Um, it's amazing how well wines will keep. Much better, I think, than we sometimes give them credit for. Have I gotten to wines? I think, oh, I, that should have been drunk a couple years ago. Of course. But it's, it's always an adventure. Okay. I hope that answered it. On to the reds. The next wine is also from Bruno Giacosa, and this is Nebbiola d'Alba. Again, Giacosa makes Barolos. I think also Barbaresco. These are basically two different towns. And by the way, one of the questions that I got previous to this, realize in one of the things that I talk about, in fact, just did uh, last week in class, is how we classify and also how we label wines. Again, for those of you who are a certain age, like me, you certainly will remember a lot of, and there still are generic wines out there. You can buy, I can still remember, I shudder to think about it, but you could buy California Pink Chablis. Of course, Chablis is, a, is an area of France that makes dry white wines made out of Chardonnay. But of course, none of that was true of the wines. They might be dry, but they certainly were not made of Chardonnay, especially if they were pink, in California. And so it was generically labeled Chablis, Sauternes, Rhine wines, those kinds of things, named because they tasted or they hoped that they would taste a little like the wines that are made in Europe. Then, of course, in fact, starting with Gallo, but then, of course, taking over almost all California wines are variety labeled. In other words, the grape variety, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, Chardonnay, all of those things. But, and again, we do some of that. Well, obviously, this is how it is and certainly is in some in Europe. But in Europe, place matters. And so Barolo, Barbaresco, again, these are in the Piedmont, uh, Gatinara, Spana, Gemme. These are towns, all in fact using the exact same grape, Nebbiolo, which is what you see on this. But the larger areas, um, which in fact can still be a DOC, as you see this wine is, you, know, you see the Denominazione di Origine Controllata under the name of the grape. These, they will then put the name of the grape because you can have a Nebbiolo d'Alba, d'Alba being the larger region, it's a town and the area surrounding it. But then you can also have Barbera d'Alba, Dolcetto d'Alba. Those are in fact two different grape varieties. And so this is why you will find the grape variety on this. So this is the same grape that is made into Barolo and Barbaresco, etc. And I'll be honest, one of my favorite grapes, because I think that these wines are often very, very good. And Nebbiolo, for a great extent, is not a traveler. You will not find Nebbiolos made practically anywhere else in the world. People are trying in California and other places, but it's not an easy grape to move, it seems. The first thing I want you to notice in this wine, and I will make sure that you can see it very well, if you, of course, many of you probably have it, how light it is. Nebbiolo, like Pinot Noir, should not be too dark. And so this wine is, in fact, has that wonderful sort of cherry look to it, uh, really quite light. 
the wonderful thing about both Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir is even though the wines are light in color, that does not mean that these are thin wines. Very on the contrary. In fact, it used to be 20, 30 years ago that Barolo Barbarescos, I mean, they would very often see three or four years of wood. And in a lot of cases, you would have to keep them for 8, 10, 12, 15 years before they really came into their own to drink. Now, obviously, well, the world has changed and winemaking has changed. And so these wines are approachable much, much younger than they used to be. And again, being just a Nebbiola d'Alba means that it is uh, again, more approachable and meant to be drunk in that, eh, I would say for Nebbiolas, in that one to five year uh, area with this. But again, you see that beautiful light color. And if you swirl and smell this wine, oh, just so pretty. Wonderful red fruits. Uh, and really red fruits more than black fruits. Cherries. Uh, again, a little strawberry. There's also, though, uh, again, a little bit of a, a darker herbal note to that. It's interesting, the classic, and again, almost uh, a really bright nose. The classic description of Barolo or Nebbiolo is tar and roses. Now, this doesn't really have much in the way of tar, but it does certainly have that really bright, beautiful raspberry note to it. Oh, yes. Just great. And if you taste this wine. <laughs> I'm a little speechless at the moment. I mean, and literally, this is Nebbiolo Dalba. That wine is, I'm sorry, that wine to me, it just hits every single note. It is so delicious. It is so full in the mouth. It's also very typical of Nebbiolo, which I really like, is that the tannins are almost granular. You feel them in your mouth. It's like there's no grains of anything in your mouth, but it's just the way, and maybe it's the way it complexes the, tan, or it complexes the proteins, et cetera, in your mouth, but it just has a, has a feel to it. It actually has that kind of feel to it. It's just sort of amazing uh, with this, and this is very distinctive. Uh, you know, and you won't get it from all Nebbiolos, and there's a few other grapes that I've tasted in, but this is very, very typical of Nebbiolo. Otherwise, again, it's those... Cherry, balsamic, raspberry, just so many incredible flavors in this wine. And I know, again, both the Nebbiolo and the Arnez are, are a bit more expensive than the, the wines that, you know, that we do. Or maybe it's the wines you will drink every day. But this is worth every penny, in my opinion. This wine has a quality that is just gorgeous. Oh, just beautiful. I have to laugh. In fact, when I when I when I feel this way about something, I I can only remember many many years ago. And if you've never gone, if you're from the Cincinnati or Cincinnati area. If you've never gone to the Lloyd Library, the Lloyd Library has probably one of the most amazing collections of books uh, on of, of botany and horticulture, etc. And they have, again, first editions, and obviously my other passion is plants. And so they have, in fact, the books of Redoute, uh Roses. He, of course, was a very famous botanist and, and painter uh, in France, etc. And I can remember just going crazy just looking at these looking at these books and having one of the graduate students walk up to me and said if you need a few minutes alone with these we understand <laughs> and that's what i think about when i think of these wines it's like oh i could spend a few minutes alone with this wine but i think i just did so nice so nice 
anyway, more of the pictures. Again, look and see how these are. These are the vines from the, in fact, you know, certainly in the same area where these wines, these are Giacosa vines uh, that they were, in fact, kind enough to send me. And you see, there it is, a trunk. And literally, you can see how they have trained that one vine along that line. Certainly amazing. Nebbiolo, as you can see, from various from various villages, uh, in actually across the Roero, in fact, in, and other areas, um, south and west, uh, age of vines, 23 to 30 years. So, so that's probably almost to be old vines. Um, uh, harvest dates in October, so late, 17 days in stainless steel. Went through malolactic fermentation, meaning that the they go the 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 malic acid turns to lactic, which of course reduces the the acid a little bit. Twelve months in, or fourteen months in French oak. I have I have a feeling that not, not much of that is new French, but it is in fact French oak. Bottled in 2020, 14 half percent alcohol, uh, pH yeah, medium. Um, optimum consumption, they say, is 2025. This wine will last to 2025 without any difficulty at all. Um, and it really is a classic Nebbiolo. Oh, yes, no question. This wine, in fact, as you can see, this is from, in fact, uh, from uh, Decanter. It got 91. And, of course, it says one of Piedmont's uh, most highly regarded producers. This wine is an excellent introduction to its range of Nebbiolos. A warm finish to the growing season ensured the grapes from the desirable Val Maggiore vineyards in uh, Vezadalba were fully ripe and healthy. Crushed red berries with a twist of orange rind. Actually, it's right, too, in the finish. I really get that right now. And chocolate lead to a soft palate of bright red fruit, subtle peppery spice, and fresh tobacco. It's a touch warming on the finish, which I, I don't get. At 14% alcohol, it should feel hot, and this wine does not feel hot at all. And I just did reds in class, and there were a couple reds I had that were, in fact, a touch hot, and I do not get that from this wine at all. And it says drinking window 2020 to 2024, and yes, easily over the next few years. That wine is just, oh, and the tobacco is now coming out in it. Yep, no question. That's the other thing, too. So that's nice about keeping the wine in a glass for a while because I did not get it now. And, and part of it, of course, I always worry about being, um, you know, uh, sort of led on by the scores. But no, you put your nose to that. And it's like, oh, tobacco, really fresh tobacco is there. Just wonderful. Wonderful. Any questions, Emily, before we get to the next one? Yeah, we do have a few. Um, sure. So, you know, I'm not very great at pronouncing these wines, but Bill said, what is the difference between the Nebbiolo and the Barolo? Um, actually, uh, what it is, is the difference is Barolo is the town. And in fact, though, every time you get a Barolo or a Barbaresco uh, and several other areas, they are always made with Nebbiolo. So Nebbiolo is the grape. The, the Barolo Barbaresco are the towns, and so it's the vineyards around the town. And so it's the geographically delimited area that you're talking about. And Barolos, and again, I mean, I could, you could do a whole class on Barolos because there are several different villages. And of course, the the, the altitude makes a difference and the, the exposure makes a difference. And of course, the soils are different. And so it's amazing the differences. And of course, you can have things like this or you can have a, an everyday Barolo. There is such a thing that may run you maybe $30, but then you will get to single vineyard Barolos, which will run you well over $100 a bottle. Um, and, and, and so there are a lot of differences in there. As I mentioned early on, the Italians really felt that, I mean, for the most part, and that's why when they did their first laws in the 60s, that they were only going to make okay wines. There are very few exceptions to that. And one of them, in fact, is in the Piemonte, even though probably two or three generations ago, these people were farmers and they were not making a lot of really good wines. But the Piedmont before the Risorgimento, in other words, in the 1850s or 1860s, were run by the House of Savoy, and they were French. And so the quality of the wines and the and the and sort of the whole wine thing was, in fact, a little better then. And so um, and so these wines have always been a bit more um, 
esteemed than most other Italian wines. Uh, and again, in the last 30 or 40 years, they've really come into their own. I will say I'm really glad that no one has really picked up on the quality of Barolos because you can still get world-class Barolos in the $40, $50 range. Again, not inexpensive, but not horrible, unlike good Bordeaux and Burgundies, which are now talking about hundreds of dollars. Uh, and so uh, they really are. They're one of my favorite wines, and and many of the better Barolos, they'll age 10, 15, 20 years without any difficulty at all. So that's the difference between Nebbiolo and Barolo. It's actually, it's the grape for those towns. Okay? Yep. And I believe that this was about one of, I know it was about one of the previous wines. Um, sure. so we asked, how exactly are these grapes harvested? Are they by hand, machine, hybrid, and does it vary by vineyard? And I think it was about the wine just before this one. Sure, and it certainly could be. Uh, it's been very interesting uh, to watch this um, uh, evolution. And trust me, we are still very much in the middle of this evolution. Um, as many of you know, the other hat I wore for so many years was I taught horticulture and I taught landscaping, and especially in horticulture. Uh, I still get the um, emails or, you know, from the various uh, greenhouses and various things about what's going on in the world of horticulture and sort of agriculture too. And it's amazing. And so typically, and I would say as little as, again, doesn't seem so long to me, 20 or 30 years ago, almost all of your best vineyards were hand harvested. That is no longer the case. Machine harvesting is becoming more and more simply because you don't have the people to do it. Uh, and because the quality of the machines and their ability to harvest have gotten better and better. Not to mention, of course, you have to have a, a pristine crop. In other words, you can't have disease or anything in there so that you can in fact machine harvest so that you don't have, because you don't have anything to sort, but still many people do hand harvest then sort by hand on a sorting table, etc. cetera, uh, with that. And so I think in fact, a couple of things I told you, some were hand harvested, some were machine harvested, but we will see machine harvesting more and more and more. The other thing is, is in fact, and this is one of the things that I've been really paying attention to be, is that robotics are, are not only here to stay, but are transforming so much of agriculture and various things where again are picking fruit and all where previously you know i mean think about it every cherry you have ever bought somebody touched those were all head harvested but it will not be very long i will guarantee you that that's no longer true and it certainly is not true for many of the of the fruits and vegetables that we are doing today so it really is a, an interesting time to be in. Uh, and so it doesn't really matter. I don't care if something was machine harvested because again, if you have really good fruit, that's okay. Okay? Yep, and we can save the rest for the end. Sure. The last wine, as you can see on your screen, uh, again, quite fancy, isn't it? Chianti Classico Reserva, Rocca Gicciarda, excuse me. And again, the thing about Italy, uh, this is, of course, is Sangiovese, actually not 100% Sangiovese, but again, look at the color. I mean, that Nebbiolo was the classic example. That wine has so much wonderful flavor, etc., and yet it's not dark. And this wine is not very dark either because it's mainly Sangiovese, which is the grape. Sangiovese, sangue, of course, blood. Giovese, Jove. So Jupiter's blood is where the name comes from. And this is made by the Baron Ricasoli, which is why this, in fact, was one of their best vineyards for a very long time. You can see, of course, in, in if you look carefully, uh, it says uh, this it was the sort of the old area of them uh, that they still own, in fact, this vineyard. Uh, that is there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Let's try the wine first. Again, um, a bit darker, but not dark by any means. Um, it's a bit opaque. You can't see through it really as well as you could from the, as of the Nebbiola d'Alba, uh, but still not real dark, which is not surprising. And if you swirl this wine and smell it, very different, a lot brighter 
a lot more of, again, there are balsamic notes there. There's, um, oh, uh, yes, um, sort of sort of plums. It's much more in the sort of blue purple fruits. Oh yeah. And the in the balsamic, I mean it really has that sort of thing because there's, there's sort of these cedary, slightly woody notes to this wine. Again, so pretty. Very different, but really nice. Mm, 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 mm. If you taste this wine. An excellent example of a Chianti. It's got that brightness and good acidity. And it really, it really comes out a little bit of, of orange. There certainly is a, there's sort of orange notes to it. A little bit of balsamic, certainly that sort of cedariness uh, that's there. Sangiovese is almost never real fruity, and this isn't. It really is. And I really don't get sort of that sort of leathery or something like that, but it, it just has, it's more of those dried fruit kind of things that are in it rather than fresh fruits. And that's very, very typical of these. In fact, yes, sort of dried apricots um, in there, some orange, those kinds of flavors rather than really fresh fruits or raspberries or anything like that that you find in there. Actually, of course, after I said that, I think, well, there actually is a little raspberry in this wine. Beautiful, really wonderful nose. Uh, again, the people at Ricasoli, uh, I have a bit of a, a relationship with Ricasoli, uh, simply because I visited them when I was at, when I taught in Luxembourg a long time ago, and Massimiliano, who is in fact still the head of viticulture there, and I spent the day, and then his wife Jamie uh, wor worked at um, worked at Ricasoli for a number of years. In fact, she basically did the uh, 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 did a number of the. Uh, the reservations and various things like that. And very often I would tell people to get in touch with Jamie. In fact, for a while there was the the uh, the Jack discount because if people would call and talk to Jamie, and of course, because I had done it, they I think would get a little bit of a break uh, on the tastings, et cetera, from that. Jamie was just great. Massimiliano was still running the vineyards. And in fact, when I was there in 2011 with the class, he they could not have been nicer. And just it was just absolutely amazing with them. So I got in touch with Jamie, and then she got me in touch with the person who's currently working there. And so they were kind enough to send me these pictures of the vineyards uh, as they look right now, because obviously I have my own pictures. But this, is, of course, is what springtime at Ricasoli looks like. And again, you see the plants just starting to grow. Uh, and in fact, I check with a friend. This is, of course, is one of the um, uh, clovers. Uh, that was growing uh, in the vineyards. You can see the vineyards just starting. If you look on the upper right-hand corner, you see the grapes just starting to rise up out of there. And so this is what springtime looks like in uh, Chianti uh, at the moment. Uh, again, uh, this wine is intense ruby color, slight garnet hues, soft entry, prevailing red fruits, long persistence finished with firm silky tannins and balanced acidity. It is 90% Sangiovese. 5% Merlot, they're now allowed to add international varieties, and 5% Canaiolo. Canaiolo, one of the classic Italian varieties that would typically go into a Chianti. By the way, it was the Baron Ricasoli who came up with the recipe, and typically in the 1860s and 70s, they would add white wine to this also, typically Malvasia or something like that, because the wines were not very good. Now you can make a Chianti Classico that's 100% Sangiovese, uh, and of course with things like this. And again, you see 93 from Suckling. This is a fantastic Chianti Classico Reserva, and I could not agree more. Displays black currants, dark plums, redder plums, tulips, and cedar. Medium to full bodied, some really, some really restrained and attractive tannins, and a tangy finish. It is beautiful. And again, I'm always happy. Uh, Ricasoli, again, uh, is just one of the, and there are so many wonderful estates, but they really are a beautiful estate to visit if you get a chance to go to Chianti. 
this in fact is uh, the um, uh, a close up of one of the clovers, in fact, in the winery itself uh, in there. So again, really nice trifolium. Oh, heavens, Incarnatus. I think I can, I should remember the genus, the species name of it. I'll be happy to answer questions, but a couple of the things I thought I would show you. Uh, again, I ran around campus today uh, to show you what spring was like in Oxford. Uh, we're a little later this year than we typically are. Uh, the reason I know this is because, of course, of Facebook, because I have pictures, I take pictures all the time. And I have things that, of course, have already been blooming at my house. And I have some beautiful flowers, again, on Facebook that are already blooming. But this is, in fact, as you can see, uh, Beta Bells that was there. Um, I also went down to Silver Biological Sanctuary. Again, one of my things that I do is do the wildflower walks at Silvor, which are Sundays at one o'clock. Uh, they're going to restrict, obviously, the number of people who are there, but we are going to do it again. But I thought it'd be fun to see. This, of course, is um, uh, Larkspur uh, coming up or Delphinium. Uh, those are the first leaves coming up telling you that, in fact, spring is coming. Uh, those are the first leaves of bluebells. Uh, Mertensia virginica, so the bluebells are coming up, but that's all that you can see out in the woodland right now. But of course, they're just beautiful flowers. Uh, and this also, this is fake, this is fa not fake, false uh, aru anemone, uh, isopyrum. Uh, and those leaves, in fact, were just coming up in Sulfur itself. I have been doing the, the uh, wildfire walks there for <laughs> longer than I care to think about. And this is what it looks like. In fact, if you look in the distance, you can barely make Merstein out through the trees. Uh, and so I thought it was nice again, because obviously it's alumni, but you can see it up there at the top of the hill in there. Um, I wanted at least to draw your attention because there's too much of this down in uh, the lane. If you ever see this leaf around, you can try to dig it out, but you certainly, in fact, may want to think about herbicides. This is a uh, an a plant called lesser celandine, which is in fact extremely invasive. Uh, anytime I see it in my place, it immediately gets dug out. And because it has these little banana-like roots, it's it's not the easiest thing you make it to make sure that you get rid of everything. Otherwise, it will reappear. And in fact, <laughs> I almost fell into four mile today because the only place I could find it blooming was in fact on a sunny south facing hillside where it was blooming. And so I had to sort of clamber down the hill right next to the creek uh, to take this picture. Uh, and so this is from uh, this is from Pepper Park uh, today. Speaking of Pepper, again, probably many of you spent time at the shelter with, of course, Burstein there in the back. So I thought I would give you a picture of that. You probably spent some happy times there. Uh, one thing you may not know is, of course, they have redone the, again, they're doing a very extensive um, uh, walkway and trails around Oxford. And so this is the new bridge that now goes across Four Mile uh, as part of that entire thing. So I thought I would show you that too, if you've not been back to Oxford for a while. And of course, some of my favorites, the wonderful, our wonderful art museum, uh, looking up on the hill uh, from it, again, on Western today in the sun. Kumbler, of course, every bit as beautiful as it always is. Uh, and then right next to there, of course, for Scythia, I'll bet it'll be blooming by Monday. We'll have enough warm weather. You can see the buds right there. It's almost getting ready to bloom. Uh, of course, I had to go over, take a picture of the Upham Arch uh, and sort of the central part of campus. Again, still waiting for its green to come along. Uh, but then finally, um, for those of you, of course, who were here a while ago, I could always tell the end of spring break because the Cornelian cherry, the Cornus moss, would always bloom next to Scheidler, right across the street from Shriver Center. And so every year around this time, it would bloom. Those plants that were removed when they redid Shriver, Shriver. But here, of course, you see right next to Harrison is, of course, the first thing that really blooms here on campus. And so I thought I would share it with you. There, of course, are its beautiful things. It's actually a dogwood. It's Cornus. Uh, but it's really wonderful to see. So I thought I would share with you a little bit of what campus looks like today. Questions, Emily? Sorry, they were, I was muted for a second. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for sharing those pictures with us. Um, a lot of people said they really enjoyed being able to see Oxford again, especially in the spring. 
Um, so one of them I'm going to put up on the screen. Somebody says, hi, Jack. We are going, Quentin, actually. We are going to Napa Valley this May. What are some of your favorites from this region? Are there any hidden gems that they should make time for? <sighs> How many weeks do you have? Uh, first of all, I mean, there are certain iconic places that I think are always great to go to. One of them, of course, is Mandavi because nobody was more important on really putting Napa Valley on the map than Mandavi. Uh, one of my favorites is Corizon, C-O-R-I-S-O-N. Uh, Kathy, uh, I just love it. You know, it's one of those people where she basically worked for 30 years or more to become an overnight sensation. And her wines, I think, are probably some of the absolute best in Napa Valley. I wish I could afford them. Uh, but again, I've taken people on tastings there and it is just wonderful. Uh, and so really very special to go to, to Corison. Um, otherwise, oh, gee, there are so many places, you know, that you can just spend time. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, as many of you know, Burgess had, had burned down. And so certainly not something. Uh, one thing I just shared with my class uh, is that Francis Ford Coppola now owns, in fact, the sort of the reconstituted Inglenook. Um, when he bought Niebaum, uh, Gustav Niebaum's estate, uh, I think it was Coca-Cola or somebody owned the name Inglenook. And so he eventually bought it. And he actually has a big area that's a, a visitor center over in Sonoma. But recently, he has redone a lounge in Inglenook called Penino, if I'm not mistaken, P-E-N-N-I-N-O, named for his maternal grandfather. And it was, and it just looks wonderful. Obviously, the tastings are not inexpensive. Uh, but again, I mean, talk about for a splurge and something that just looked so sophisticated and so neat that I really thought that certainly is something that's on my list of things to visit the next time I go. Um, otherwise, you got to spend, you got to go to at least one sparkling winemaker. And Chandon or Gloria Ferrar uh, are both on the list, as, as is Carneros Creek. Uh, gee, where else would I go? I mean, there are just so many wonderful places. It depends on the wines you like or not. Uh, Cliff Led, uh, Ovid, uh, uh, Darius. Um, uh, again, you know, just there really are. I mean, that's just, of course, just a sampling of, of just so many wineries that are there. And you probably gave me a little more time, I could probably tell you. But right off the top of my head, those are the places that I would really like to go back and see. Awesome. Thank you. Um, sure. Who makes your favorite Italian wine? <laughs> Usually the person, the one I'm drinking. Uh, let me think about this. I, uh, that's really, that's really tough. Uh, I, of course, obviously, I love the Riccasoli wines. Uh, I also really like the Amarone uh, from Mazi, M-A-S-I, uh, have always been some of my favorites. Um, I think it's fairly obvious that I really like uh, Barolos. And so it can be, you know, it can be Mocha Gata. It can be uh, Renato Ratti. Uh, it can be, uh, God, in fact, I'm trying to, my, my mind, I've got too many wines in my head. So certainly a number of Barolos and Barbarescos are great. And even Nebbiolo Dabos from the, these, because again, it's one of my favorite grapes. Um, interestingly enough, some people from the South, I really like some of the truly ancient varieties like Falangina or Fiano d'Avellino uh, that come from the south, um, from Mastro Berardino, uh, et cetera. I mean, there are so many, Italy has an embarrassment of riches. I mean, there's so many amazing wines from the places, again, from very expensive, that are truly amazing to wines that are sort of unsung, that are still so tasty, uh, that those are just a, a small portion of the things I like. Awesome. Um, okay. What things do you look for when buying a new wine that you haven't tasted before? 
Great question. One thing, I like trying new things. And so obviously I've tried and true, but it's like, if it's a new grape variety, that's one of the things, because again, it opens up your mind and opens up your palate to different ideas. And so, and so I'm always trying different, different things. I really think that that's really uh, good to look for. Also, I have no problem. In fact, uh, you know, I look at, but I can't say that I am, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the word that I want. I don't follow scores like slavishly. Um, I look at them, but it's not like, oh, that got 94. Well, of course, typically I can't afford it. Uh, and so uh, and so I don't, but it's like, but I am more than happy to go. I don't mind telling you. I mean, you know, I when I go to jungles, I talk to Michael, uh, who's there. He's the fine wine manager. And so it's like, Michael, what's good? What do you think? You know, and, and so I will do that. And I'll also say, again, you know, I like everybody else, I, and I think I'm certainly my my mother's son. I like a bargain, and so I will I will go through the section at jungles where they have wines that are sort of marked down, and I may buy a bottle, and then I may come back the next day and buy a case because you can find some really good ones. One of the things I just told the class, well, two things actually. One is this: we're getting to it's a shame that it has a season, but we're getting to rosé season, uh, and so and obviously the 2020s. In fact. I just got some 2020, uh, you know, from FedEx just uh, yesterday. Uh, and so the 2020s are already out there. And so the pro the thing is, is a lot of the 19s then will go for nothing. And in many cases, there's nothing wrong with those wines. I mean, they still are very drinkable because people want the youngest uh, rosés all the time. They won't have them. The other thing I always tell people is never forget that Rieslings can age. And so if you can find a Riesling that may be, and so they'll be selling it off for a lot for a lot cheaper, that wine can often still be very, very good and very tasty. Uh, and so those are a couple of things that I, those are probably the things I look for. And again, as I think it's fairly obvious to these tastings, I love sparkling wines. I like Nebbiolos. I like Pinot Noirs. I like Gewürztraminers. I like white burgundies. I mean, there are just certain wines that I just sort of gravitate to more than others. But it's what's really great is being surprised by the grapes that I don't usually go to and think, wow, that was really good. And so I think just keeping an open mind is probably the most important thing. All right. So I know I know we're running close on time, but we do have a few more really good questions I want to get to. So we'll, we'll treat them as rapid fire questions. Fine. Um, so Jason wants to know, what is the most popular or most purchased wine in the world? And I don't know if you know that or if you have an idea of what. Well, I mean, it's impossible to say exactly. Certainly, I mean, there's certainly tons of barefoot in the world. When I think of, again, we because I actually were talking about this. I mean, when I think of Chardonnays, I think of Kendall Jackson. Kendall Jackson was the most widely uh, bought Chardonnay for like 20 some years running. Uh, you know, again, if they're, they're Vintner Selector, or I can't remember what it's called now, but something along those lines. Uh, and so it was really along those lines. But again, it's probably a Gallo product because Gallo now basically sells practically one third of all the wine sold in America. And so it's probably currently something with barefoot would be my guess. Yeah, that's, I hate to admit it, but that's a little along like the lines of things I like to purchase. Um, <laughs> you know that. So somebody asked, um, three wines everyone should have on hand for summer entertaining because it is looking hopeful, she says. Um, sure. But she wants to keep it more in the 15 to $25 range. Darn, because I was going to say champagne, champagne, champagne. That's, not, that's my range. So keep it in the $15 to $25 range. <laughs> Prosecco. I mean, to me, there are a few things that are better. You know, and again, it really has been nice to see that people, you know, don't treat bubbly as a special occasion anymore. And so you can find some good sparkling wines, just not Prosecco, but especially Prosecco, in that $10 to $15 range. And so I would always keep that on hand. Uh, again, those Vermentinos that we had tonight, I mean, why wouldn't you have that on hand to give people a glass of that? I mean, the quality is there. They're not expensive. So why not? I mean, that certainly is thing. And again, of course, you know, because it's summertime, Rosés, Charles and Charles, Beeler. Uh, and I could go on and on. There are so many rosés that are cost less than $15 that are 
very easily drinkable, really wonderful, great with aperitif, light food. Some have enough, you know, oomph to it that it goes with barbecue. And so, and so those are the first things I would say off the top of my head. Perfect. Okay. And these two are more Oxford, Miami related. Um, but somebody asked, are they doing the Oxford Wine Fest this year? And I think maybe they're talking about what you're doing. This uh, could be two things. There is the Oxford Wine Festival, and okay. it's typically been on Memorial Day. And I actually haven't talked to Kelly, but I have a feeling, simply because of COVID, that there was, because we talked about trying to do something last year, sort of that would be online, uh, that they could do. But as far as I know, they have no intention of doing so now. The other one, of course, typically was end of February, early March, is the Performing Arts Wine Tasting, which I've always had a major amount to do, but I've always done the Oxford one also. Um, and obviously, you know, we're certainly hoping for 2022, my Lord, uh, in there. And we may try to do something in the fall. It would be certainly truncated, but it would be nice to do that to get wine people together. And hopefully we can get together again soon. All right. And one more is, are you teaching students in person or online or both? Uh, good question. Actually, this semester I have three sections of uh, of wines class due to COVID. In fact, we're in, for those of you who've ever had the, uh, it actually hasn't been so bad, but I shouldn't make, maybe make fun of it, but the, the sort of uh, ill luck of being in 100 U's because it seats more than 200 people. Um, but in fact, actually, the people in chemistry have been wonderful to me, and I cannot overstate that. They have just been excellent. Uh, the chair has been great. And so, um, uh, and so I'm actually teaching face-to-face -face Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But again, because of COVID, et cetera, what I do is actually on Monday evening, I do the lecture online so that people can see it anytime, and especially, I hope, before they come to class. And then I do a quick recap, and, and I keep trying to make it shorter. I talk too much. Uh, I treat, uh, you know, do a recap of the class, hitting the high points, and then we do the tastings in person. Because again, we can be mask to mask, and then, of course, once everyone has the wine, they can take their mask off, and everyone, of course, is is very far away from each other, except for those people who are in their own pods, uh, in other words, roommates, et cetera. And so that's what we can do. And so I have uh, about 175 students in class right now uh, with that. And it's it's great. It's just great to see them again. Eventually I'll maybe see them without their masks, but so far we haven't had that luxury. All right. And that is all we have for tonight. So again, Felice Primavera from Miami alumni. Thank you very much for this evening. And thank you, Jack. Um, and thank you again for all of you who joined us tonight. Um, we had a lot of questions come in, so I apologize if we were not able to get to your question, but stay tuned. We will have more Jack wanting things in the future. Um, so for those of you that were asking, Jack is on campus in the Staley Lounge um, in the Bernstein Alumni Center. Of course, he is practicing social distancing and wearing a mask when not on camera. Um, I do invite you to check out our other alumni association webinars. Um, they are free and open to all. You can find those on our webinar site, alumlc.org slash Miami OH, um, or just on our Miami alumni site as well. Um, so with that being said, have a great weekend and love and honor.